Okay, this is a heads up, um, you know, video, Vimeo update on what I'm doing with the channel so that in case you prefer to go here because it's simpler, um, you know, what am I doing with it? First of all, you can find it very easily or just click on the link in the video description, vimeo.com slash brain out. Okay, and here's my avatar, so you know it's me, because there are other people, some of them in Italy, who also call themselves Brain Out, and there are some people in China who tried to um, buy my domain, who also call themselves Brain Out. Now, I don't know why they're doing that. The guy in Italy predates me, um, and the people in China, I, I don't know if they're doing it because of me, or they just like the name. But I refuse to sell my domain, okay? So if you want, just Vimeo.com brain out, and that's how you can find me, all right? And the link to this will be in the video description. And then this is the profile page about me, in case you're interested. And what I tried to do here, because, you know, unlike YouTube, in Vimeo, you get to have a very long profile of yourself. So I explained my nickname because that question comes up an awful lot. People ask me, why do you call yourself Brain Out? It's based on Ephesians 4.23. And the idea is to remind me to use 1 John 1 9 because I sin a lot. That's why I use the nickname. Okay? Um, people like that nickname, so I've had it since the late 1990s. I've been on YouTube as Brain Out since the late 1990s. I started as um, doing web pages and web TV, and I started doing um, chat in um, the undernet. So there's a record of me public, for better and for worse, going all the way back to the late 1990s on the internet. Therefore, my anonymity is not is and is not there. You know all about me that's relevant, except for the fact that. There's a whole bunch about me you're not going to know because I need to protect my family. They do not share my interest in scripture. They think I'm crazy. Okay, and maybe I am. That's for you to determine. But I need the anonymity to protect my family. So I can say or be whatever I got to be or say for right or wrong in order to, to post these videos, okay? So then the next thing in this little profile is the web content and videos. Okay, basically, I cover heavy exegetical stuff you can't find elsewhere in Christendom. All right, you can't find it elsewhere in Christendom because people aren't talking about it. I mean, sometimes in a seminary class, the stuff I'm covering will come up. Sometimes amongst two scholars, they'll talk about stuff related to this, but there's nothing out for the public. And since the information is so earth-shattering, okay, it's not fair for me to keep quiet about it. And it's also not fair if I try to make money on it, so it's all out there for free. And God has given me a business which doesn't require a whole lot of my time, so I can make money to, enough money to keep body and soul together and do these web pages and do the videos. That's my life, if you want to know. I have no social life. All I do in my spare time are the videos and the web content. And I'm very happy doing that because the only thing I care about now, the only thing I have faith in now is God. Okay? I don't care if I'm right or wrong. If I'm wrong, God will show it to me and I'll fix it. I don't care if people like me. I mean, I don't want them to hate me because that will make them feel bad. But personally, honey, I don't even like myself, so I don't care if you don't like me either. All I care about is what does God say? Am I wrong in my reporting or not? If I'm wrong, he'll spank me or correct me. Or he'll hire some other human being to come tell me where I'm wrong. He even hired an atheist to tell me where my meter was wrong in Psalm 90. That was, uh, what, four years ago. So I listen to your comments if you're, you know, what do you want to call it, um, critical? I care about that. I, I want to know. That's rubies and gemstones to me, if you're critical. But if all you do is mouth off, you know, complaints or ranting, then I can't benefit from your criticism. All right? But, and conversely, a whole lot of people are, you know, treating me like the second coming of Christ. 
which I'm not. I'm a brain now, just like you. In fact, I'm probably worse than you. But God has a sense of humor, and he'll pick even an ass in the Old Testament to tell Balaam the word of God. All right, so he's picking this ass, too, if what I'm saying is true, God will witness to it. So I ought to put it out there, right? Okay, so right now I'm focusing on Bible's rhetorical styles to resolve all the debates in Christendom. Okay, principally I'm focusing on how Hebrew meter resolves when Bible books were written, how do you interpret them, how do you read prophecy. Okay, because scholars have debated whether Bible even has meter for 300 years. It goes back to a guy named Loth, L-O-U-W-T-H. -O -O you can look him up on the internet. And they still haven't found it. How come? Well, because they're looking for a different kind of meter than the Bible has. Okay, they're looking for Western standards of meter, like strophe and die stitch and all these other Western ideas of what meter is. Bible doesn't use those conventions. It uses sevens. Okay, so the header video that you should be looking at on this to find it yourself is this one. Bible Hebrew Time Meter 30 Testing Characteristics. You can download this document yourself, test any Bible passage you want per meter. It took me several years to know what the characteristics were because I had to find many passages in Scripture that were metered to find out what they're doing. Okay, but now I know. So here, you can download it and test it yourself. All you have to do is be able to count syllables and read history books. And then you can find it. Okay, so anyway, this is my little story about the, the useless brain out that I am. And then if you want to know something about my pastor, here you go. If you want to know something about my beliefs, which aren't too many, okay, faith alone in Christ alone. The second you believe in Christ, you're forever saved. Okay, the Calvinists and the Catholics got everything bass backwards, so I'm against them. They, they don't get 100% of the Bible wrong, but doggone near. Okay? And I have to say that. I'm Trinitarian, but not according to the definition of the Calvinists. You know, the Westminster Confession is horrible. It doesn't understand what Trinity is. Yeah, God is three persons. Okay? But he's not a hydra-headed monster. And that's what the Catholics and the Calvinists are all trying to turn him into. So I'm not that kind of Trinitarian. But it is definitely Trinitarian by the normal definition of the word, just not by the normal writing in the Westminster Confession or Catholic Unicity definitions. Okay? Am I dispensationalist? You bet. But not, not the way dispies classify themselves today because God has a different set of time that he uses for his dispensation. It's based on 2100 year periods. Okay? And that's what my, my main, main, main channel is about how God orchestrates time right here. If you want proof of this kind of dispensationalism, which is the Bible's own, not what we say in, in theology today. It's very similar to what we say in theology today, but it lacks the understanding of the Bible's own dates. And if you look at the Bible's own dates and forget all the extra Bible talk that people come up with and just look at the Bible only, then you see how God orchestrates time. And then you see what true biblical di dispensationalism is. Now the dispies will kind of, if they studied this, they would kind of breathe a sigh of relief. Because God's Bible definition of dispensationalism totally shoots down all preterist ideas, whether it's partial preterism or full preterism. All preterists are proven to be completely and utterly apostate. It proves replacement theology is a joke, not at all biblical. And so the dispies would have a great deal of relief if they just learned the Bible's own definition of dispensations. So that's why I did this playlist. Okay? How God Orchestrates Time is also in YouTube. It's mostly in the Yapping Most High 
playlist in YouTube. But not all of the Yapping Most High videos relate to this topic, so I selected among them the ones that do, and they're in, you know, chronological order, or, you know, concept order, and they start real simple with drawings, and they get real complex with a worksheet where I took all of the Bible's dates, all of them, and I plotted them in a worksheet that you can download and test yourself from the Bible. And when you do that, you'll find out, oh golly, God knows how to account time. Oh golly, all of our history books coincide with the Bible. Oh golly, the Bible's right in its dates. And if you don't do that, You'll say what most scholars say. Oh, the Bible's very difficult and it's inscrutable and it doesn't look like it's very historical. See, because they don't use the Bible. They use other scholars. Honey, number one scholar is God. Use him. And then go look in your history books. I'm sorry to be so, you know, what do you want to call it, irate? But I'm sick to death of people trashing scripture who claim to be pro-Christ or pro-God. They're not, they're not doing their homework. And there shouldn't have to be a brain out like me making videos like this to prove how wrong and inept they are. And I'm sorry, that's a very dramatic claim. And some would claim that it's an arrogant claim of mine. Honey, if it's arrogant, then how come the Bible is, is shown to agree? It's not my claim. It's the Bible's claim. The Bible is right. What's so arrogant about that? All right? Sorry, let me end the rant and go back to the channel so you know what I got here. All right, so if you click on alphabetical here, you see you've got Vimeo.com brain out channels, okay? And then it tells you sort alpha, which is what I just did. See, this is sorting by date, which is useless. Sorting by alpha, I've alphabetically titled the channels, which are playlists. How God orchestrates time. If you're interested in that topic, start there. Because that just goes through the math, okay? Now, in alphabetical order is not the way you should view the videos. You start here with the math, how God orchestrates time. Then you go to either Psalm 90, which goes through this how, how to read Psalm 90 to understand that's what it is, is a theme of how God orchestrates time. Or you can go to the flood precedence, because Psalm 90 starts with, Adam in the flood. That's its context. All right. The trouble is, is that if you start with the Noahic flood first, there's a whole bunch of unanswered questions there. So I would suggest you go to Psalm 90 first, because Psalm 90 has a has a certain resonance in Judaism. The Jews all know that Psalm 90's theme is on how God orchestrates time to bring about. Israel returning to God. They all know that. They've known it forever. But they don't read the, the psalm. They don't read the meter. They know it's meter. They don't read the meter right. They're me reading the meter as if it's like in 50-year increments. It's in 70-year increments. And so I prove that using this playlist in Psalm 90. All right? And it also validates the real date of the Exodus, which the scholars still debate. And the Jews even get the Exodus date wrong. Yeah, well, honey, if you paid attention to Psalm 90, you'd know what the Exodus date really was. Because Moses date lines when he writes. Okay, and I go through that in the Psalm 90 playlist. It's not the whole playlist. It's the, the videos in the playlist that are most relevant to the topic. Okay, and there's a whole bunch of them. Okay, in chronological order, pretty much. All right, the same playlist is in YouTube, but it's got a lot of extraneous videos in it because I had to explain more in YouTube. All right, so I would suggest if you're really trying to do this topic, do this one first, how God orchestrates time, get a handle on the math. All right, and then do Psalm 90 and go through it so that you can understand how Moses wrote Psalm 90. Moses wrote Psalm 90 like a four-act play. Okay, verses 1 through 4 is the like the prologue of the play. God's going to accomplish his will. A thousand years 
millennium promise to Christ. And then verses 5 through 8 of Psalm 90 is the first actor getting on stage representing the Adamic you know, generation up until the flood. Because in those days they lived for a thousand years. Okay? And then the next generation is the Noahic generation. And of course Noah didn't quite live that long because there were problems as a result of the flood as far as man's longevity and the fact that sin had corrupted the biology so much. Okay, so then Noah has his testimony. It's not necessarily Noah, but someone speaking for the whole group for that 1050, the Noahic 1050. And then in, in Psalm 90, verses 12 through 15, it's autobiographical. Moses is the actor on stage. And everything in the Bible about how God orchestrates time is what he asked for in Psalm, Psalm 90, verses 12 through 15. And then in Psalm 90, verses 16 and 17, a final, you know, anonymous actor gets on stage asking for rebuilding, which is poignant because that's the voting period that followed Purim and Israel was almost destroyed by Haman. Okay, I go through all that detail and show you the history and all the rest of it in the Psalm 90 playlist. So you do this one first, okay, how God orchestrates time. Then I suggest you do that one next. And then if you're looking for the Noahic precedence for it, but it's got a lot of conundrum left, then go here on the Noahic flood precedence. I'm going to have to work on that. There are still some things to resolve in it. But the Jews all know that the Noahic year that God describes in, in Genesis 7 and 8, they all know that it's the precedence for the year in Israel's calendar. There's a guy named Jack P. Lewis, and I cover, I mentioned his book in this video here, the second one, not this one, but this one. Um, he wrote a dissertation doing a survey of what was known about the precedence of Noah's flood for determining time, what was known in ancient Christian and Jewish literature. He didn't come to any conclusions. He just did a survey of what was there. So, and you can get his dissertation on Amazon. Um, I think it's like $124. You can also get it in Google Books. And the links to where you can get it are provided in this video here. Okay, no egg flood precedents for our church age. Okay, so that would be the third channel that you could watch if you haven't thrown up already. Then the next one after that should be um, Paul. And that comes here. This is the GGS series, GGS 10 and 11 series in YouTube. Again, I'm only selecting the videos most relevant because I had to cover a lot of other things in GGS. So it starts really with 11G, which is right here. And then it goes pretty much in order, leaving out the Magnificat, which is 11S, all the way to the end. Okay, which at this point, I haven't finished GGS yet. I'm still mapping Constantine via Paul's Anaphora. Okay, but I've actually posted in Vimeo all of the, you know, the latest GGS videos in YouTube. So instead of watching them in YouTube, you can watch them here. Okay, so that's what you should do next after viewing the flood thing. So it's this one, then down here to Psalm 90, then the flood thing, Noahic flood, then Paul, okay? They won't let me organize the channels manually, all right? So I, I have to tell you this video. Then Paul, and then, depending on how you feel about it, the simplest way to get a handle on the meter is to look at the Magnificat. And this is also in YouTube. I did most of her playlist starting at episode two and then going all the way to the end. Um, the Magnificat playlist, playlist in YouTube is reproduced here starting here at 11S2. Because 11S1 was, I made mistakes. Okay, and this video corrects them. All right, and then it goes all the way to the end. And it's only 12. There's only 12 videos in this list. And it helps you get a real clear understanding of how the meter works. Paul plays his meter off Mary. That's where his meter comes from. She plays off Daniel, who plays off Psalm 90 and Isaiah 53. So if you wanted, you could, you know, after you went 
hear how God orchestrates time, back down your Psalm 90, then hear the flood precedence. You could next go to Mary. Okay, because that's the chronological order of the Bible's presentation of the meter. And then go to Paul. And last, you're going to go to Peter, and I'm still uploading Peter. How Peter tracks the same future Roman history as Paul. And in the case of the Peter list, this Peter list is also in YouTube, but I take significant digressions with Peter. So just the ones explaining Roman future history are here in Vimeo. Okay, just watch them in order. Okay, and again, in order to do that, Vimeo makes it real easy. You can just use um, the couch mode here. Okay, hold on. Sorry, I'm often interrupted with computer phone calls. Um, just use the couch mode here, and it'll, it should operate to play the videos in order. Now, let me make one last comment, because I've pretty much finished now. This is a lot of material. It took me, let's see, I started writing about this in the year 2000. I learned about how God orchestrates time in 2004, okay? There's a lot of information out on the Internet that tries to say something similar to what I'm telling you. I didn't know that when I came up with this. I don't know if they're copying me, okay, or if they're, they came up with it at the same time on their own. For example, John Hagee has got the completely wrong anti-biblical 490 accounting system. He's using Israel's political establishment in 1948 and going backwards. That's not how the Bible does it. Israel's political establishment in 1940 is completely irrelevant. Bible's been accounting time in 490 year increments since Genesis 5. Okay? So, the, the base point I want you to understand here, I don't know if you should spend the time on learning this. I have to. That doesn't mean you have to. Some select individuals that God's going to pick have to, just like me. I don't know who they are. If you're in that group and God has told you, yes, you should pay attention to this, this Vimeo channel is designed to make life easier for you to do that. Otherwise, if God hasn't expressly told you to learn this doctrine now, then don't pay attention to my videos. Not on this topic, anyway. I do a lot of videos on other topics, too, which are also in YouTube. But this channel, this Vimeo thing, is solely dedicated to how God orchestrates time. All right? And just to show you, there are more playlists that are not in Vimeo that end up being related to how God orchestrates time. And so to show you what they are, to show you how I did that, I went to my portfolios. And then where it says here, more playlists, I stuck in the other playlists in YouTube, the header videos of them with links to where those videos are in YouTube so that you could, if you needed to, look at the related video playlist. Genesis, because that has to do with how God orchestrates time. James 2 is on why God is orchestrating time with church. So that's relevant. Matthew's mistranslation, okay, is part of a two whole playlists, one on the Pope myth and the other one on King James onlyism. That matters because it shows you the trends that occur to make God destroy basically a whole generation in the last 120 years of a 490. These are two huge apostasies, Catholicism and King James onlyism. Okay, and they're at odds with each other, and they're both apostate. So that's why that relates. The fact that the Lord is born on Hanukkah is central to the whole reason why God orchestrates time. And nobody seems to know that in Christendom. Okay? The New Testament, how it threads the LXX is relevant because that's how you determine a lot of the doctrines about how God orchestrates time, specifically the rapture and how it ties back to bridging to Israel's time. Okay? 
that Mark's gospel is third is vital to understanding the timeline of the New Testament books because they all relate to Israel's time also. And then finally, the synoptics playlist. This is the header video in the synoptics playlist. And that matters so that you know that Mark's gospel is third, Matthew is first, and we're all the bridge back to Israel. There's no such thing as replacement theology at all. And one of the ways you know that is to know the order of the Gospels and how they work together. Which, of course, is not covered in Christendom. Because Christendom is done, you know, dominated by the Calvinists and the Catholics, and both of them are preterists. Alright, so that's that problem there. And then there's this thing called My Albums, which I've already covered before. These are basically downloads, vids that I talk about in... Um, YouTube playlist that you can download. Okay? These are the downloadable videos. Because I used to put the, the downloads in Blip TV, but Blip TV doesn't want the kind of videos I do, so I moved over to Vimeo. Now, this all happened during this last couple of weeks. All right? That's why I'm making videos on Vimeo now and explaining them. All right? So these are all downloads. So think of album, my albums as downloads and in the video descriptions in YouTube okay when you come across in the video description something say download here this is where you, they'll be directing you I've already updated all those video descriptions so that's about it I'm sorry this took so long but it's comprehensive and if you're meant to study what I write or what I say and some people are then this will be important to you. If you're not meant to, just blow me off. Signing off.